Hello, it's Monday morning. Garland Nixon here with Jose Vega. He's running for Congress as an independent in um, New York. We're going to talk about his platform. Let's talk. Hey there, all uh, Garland Nixon here with Jose Vega. He's running for Congress in New York City. He's running against a guy named Richie Torres and Richie Torres is everything that is bad. He is everything that's horrible about um, US politics. You know, he's there just for the show. He goes along with whatever they want. And, you know, they give the old, uh, he's a uh, Latino, he's LGBTQ, whatever the hell, he's all of these things. But when it comes down to it, he's just a conduit for power. He is nothing but just an open spigot through which the neocons and the billionaires and all of the people that are screwing this country over and endangering the world, they can work through people like him. So he doesn't really exist. He, he I, I would argue he doesn't, he's nothing. He doesn't exist. Um, all right. But Jose Vega exists. Uh, Jose, let's talk about, let's do this. Let's get down to your uh, platform, your policies. And, you know, we hear when, you know, when we talk about, let's start with Ukraine, We because that's a big one. Um, we, that, we're going to go with the two big ones and then we'll go to three. But at any rate, let's start here. Um, your concept of this conflict you know, I want people to hear you say, how did it start? Where are we? What should be done to fix it? You know, because we like, how did it start? You know, we get the stuff. Well, Putin just woke up one day in a bad mood and said, I hate democracy. And they're nice little people on my border. I think I'll attack them. Your, your, uh, your idea. How do you think it happened? You know, what brought us here? Where are we? What needs to have, they happen to fix it? Jose Vega. Well, um, you know, I think uh, us as like people who who have to talk about this often, I I don't know how we don't get tired about explaining how this 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 conflict began, and also it kind of depends where you want to start because the Tucker Carlson interview with Putin was hilarious. That Putin's like, well, if you want to understand Ukraine today, let's go back to the 1300s. You know, <laughs> like, let's go back to that. Um, well, make things simple, not to go back too far. This all started in 2014 with Victoria Newland, who was part of the U.S. arm to instigate a coup in Ukraine, what's called the Maidan coup, of course. And so <clears throat> there's this famous video of her handing out cookies to all the Ukrainians. And um, there were youth groups that were funded by the neo-Nazi wing in Ukraine called the Social Nationalist Party, the Zavoda Political Party, which was run by this guy named Oleg Tyanabak. And Oleg Tyanabak in Ukraine uh, is seen as a neo-Nazi figure. He 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 openly is anti-Semitic. He has openly said that we need to kill Muscovites as well as Jews, uh, and that's how the conflict kind of began because this neo-Nazi wing was being given arms and weapons from the United States in 2014 to oust Yanukovych, the current the the. Oh, excuse me, sorry. I hope you can still hear me. It'll be fixed in just a second. My camera, but yeah, okay. Can yeah, you you're still hear me? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. You know, um, uh, uh, but um, yeah, so 2014, the neo Nazis are getting money, arms, and weapons from the United States, and Victoria Newland is the conduit to that. And uh, uh, what they then do uh, is they overthrow Yanukovych because Yanukovych, rather than working with more with the EU on this aid deal, they were going to start working with Russia on a better aid package. And so the Maidan coup happened where only 5% of the protesters at the Maidan coup were actually violent. Uh, 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 that's because this was incited by the US State Department. And so Yanukovych got out of town. And as a result, Ukraine has been a puppet state ever since then. At that point, that was the inception. And so the neo-Nazis basically started running the land and they started shelling the Eastern part of Ukraine over and over and over again. And so since 2015 to about 2022, the Russians have been like screaming and yelling like, hey, to the UN, to the world, like, hey, we have people who are shelling 
the border of Russia, the Donetsk and Lugansk region, uh, every day, thousands and thousands of people, you know, between those years, just dead because of the shelling and nobody's doing anything. And Zelensky, when he first became president, actually ran on a peace platform. And people forget this, right? Zelensky ran on this platform of like, well, we can actually have peace between Russia and Ukraine if we actually want there to be peace. And this is one of the reasons why he won. And while you look at him now, and it's uh, not about peace at all. And so 2022 comes around February of 2022 when this conflict actually begins. Um, you know, we learned since then that like the Minsk agreements, which was this agreement that Germany and other countries helped facilitate that to try and kind of bring, you know, some kind of the stabilizing peace to the region, it was all just deployed so that the neo-Nazi wing of Ukraine and also the military of Ukraine can kind of build up for a, uh, 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 a direct confrontation with Russia. What they didn't anticipate is that the Russians, because if you poke the bear enough, are not going to wait around and play. And now you have this meat grinder that is Ukraine. And on the battlefield, the Ukrainians are just getting absolutely slaughtered. Not to say the Russians aren't having, you know, getting losses, but nowhere near the losses that Ukrainians are getting. I mean, it's absolutely insane. And so where we are now is ever since the start of the war, there have been attempts at peace. And you've had people like Bojo or Boris Johnson sabotaging peace talks. Like this could have ended April of 2022. Um, and uh, their negotiations were ready to go, and even people in the top level of the Ukrainian government were ready to, to accept this, and all of a sudden, it's gone. And of course, NATO. NATO is the other, other influencing factor here. I, I don't want to forget NATO, but also when you look at like the funding of NATO and which countries actually give most money to NATO, you see that the United States is the biggest contributor to what actually keeps NATO afloat. And this is one of the things that made Diane Sayre famous two years ago. She put out this billboard said U.S. out of NATO now. And people said, well, why not just call for the dismantling of NATO? Well, because the U.S. is NATO. Like that's mm -hmm. that's the, like, the U.S. is NATO. And I think people people uh, aren't aren't seeing that. So now you've had this terrorist attack in Moscow. Russia knows who did it. We know who did it. It was the U.S. and NATO. They don't try to hide it. They say, no, 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 this was ISIS-K. Like, Please, ISIS is a U.S. invention that was made to be deployed around the world whenever they needed some kind of terrorist attack. What that actually was was a, hey, Putin, congrats on your re-election campaign. We're going to go shoot up your theater now. That's actually what that was. And the Russians are pissed off about it. And now the war has started because the language that the Russians have been using has always been special military operation, special military operation. Now it's a war. OK, now it's actually a war. And ever since that Carlson Putin interview, when Putin said everything east of the Dnieper River, which is just on the border of, of Kiev, belongs to Russia. Historically, that's, I think, where we are at this point now. All right. That's, I think, what's what's where where we are at this point. So that's how I see Ukraine. That's how we started. That's where we were. That's where we are now. You know, it's going to get this. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> How do you see the conflict in Ukraine fitting into the greater scheme of the neocons for, you know, shall we say, world domination and hegemony? How does that fit in there from your perspective? Because uh, the thing is, is you have countries like China and Russia and now the BRICS countries that are refusing to go along with this uh, rules based order, unipolar world, as if to say, like the West has, you know, complete dominance over all these other countries. And so Ukraine and Russia is just one part of the puzzle to try and dominate Russia, where Taiwan is like another part to try and dominate China. They think that through military conflicts, they can contain these countries and either distract them or successfully overthrow them, but they can't. And the world would be a lot better for the West if China and Russia didn't exist. So Russia and China exist, uh, they're, they're kind of like blockades. They're like the hard stops to total Western dominance and Western colonial powers. Um, that are trying to, well, first of all, depopulate a large majority of the world, especially in the minority countries, because there's a belief that there may be too many people on this planet and there aren't enough resources for everyone. So they'd rather 
depopulate people. I mean, this was just openly stated uh, in the State Department. This was this was the policy in the 1970s, and it still is today. Henry Kissinger put out a document called National Security Memorandum 2000, um, which openly said our job needs to be to depopulate a lot of the earth because there's just too many people and there's not enough resources for the earth to contain us all. So this is where you get the wars. This is where you get the coups. This is where you get the destabilization, right? And then in 1980, Thomas Ferguson, a State Department agent for uh, uh, population affairs, has openly said in an interview, well, look, if countries don't play ball with our depopulation efforts, and, you know, of course, they in Puerto Rico is one example where they uh, sterilized a third of their women, right, through birth control methods and through the operation, which is now in Puerto Rico, uh, La Operación, um, then you get this, is what he said verbatim, then you get what's going on in El Salvador. And in El Salvador at the time, 1980, was a bloody civil war where people were just killing each other. That was an open admission that that was a U.S. manipulated war. So if people don't naturally depopulate their own countries, you're going to get war. And then you'll be depopulated that way. And so that's what is the that's how Ukraine kind of fits into this bigger scale because they actually think they can win. <laughs> they think they can win. And it's only been recently that there's been people who are like, wait, maybe we actually can't win this war. But it's also a lack of humanity, right? They really have when you say 500,000 Ukrainians of dead, they're like, it means nothing to them. They have no humanity. They don't understand or fathom what that actually means, that 500,000 people have died. They're just going to be like, great, let's recruit another 100,000. And now you have this thing with, with, with France saying like, oh, we will. No, we won't. Yes, we will put troops into you know the Ukrainian border. It's absolutely insane that they keep going, but they think they can dominate the world militarily. They think they can win through this proxy war, and they can't. And they think that if they just exhaust Russia, then maybe things will go out their way. And that's that's all it was. So the way this fits into the grander scheme of things is they're trying to knock Russia and China out so they can keep their domination over the West, and it's not working. Um, your thoughts on uh, the Gaza conflict? Same thing. What created the Ga the Gaza conflict? You know what what what's the you know in the same way you can start whenever you want. You know whatever date or time you want. But your thoughts about what created the Gaza conflict and where we are? And I'm I'm wrong to even call it a conflict. It's just a an, yeah. you know an open attack on um, unarmed civilians uh, more than anything else. But anyway, where where your thoughts on where this started and where we are now? Well, you know, uh, it's been a it's been a few months, I think two months now since I was last on your show. So I've done a lot of reading, extensive reading, and I've surrounded myself with people who are much more knowledgeable in it. So from what I've learned and gathered, I mean, there were many uh, mass expulsions of Palestinians even before Israel was ever considered a country. They called the Nakbas. And in 1948, when um, uh, Israel was granted its statehood and granted its its uh, its sovereignty as a country, one of the conditions was that it would work with the UN to implement right of return so that all of the people who were refugees would be allowed to come back. And that was one of the conditions on which like, okay, you can be founded as a state, uh, as a country, but you gotta make sure that people actually come back. That's never been followed through. It's never been followed through. Um, I it's kind of like the, it's, it's kind of like the Palestinians versions of the Minsk Accords, you know what I mean? It really is. If you yeah. think about it, it was, no. hey, look, let's uh, strike a deal where nobody hurts anybody and you go along with the Russians and it'll be a peaceful outcome. And every time the Russians would say, OK, we got this deal, the West would say, yeah, no. And it's kind of the same thing. Hey, we got a deal where the Palestinians can have a right to return. And every time the Palestinians say, hey, how about our deal? They'd be like, yeah, no. And basically, in a nutshell, you know, I got to say this. It shows one thing. You can't make a deal with these people. Well, you can, but you can never expect them to keep their end of the deal. At any rate, I just had to throw that in there because it sounds yeah. so much like the Minsk Accords and every other deal the neocons make. But anyway, continue with what you were saying. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I will return on that point when I get to the chronology a little later. So, sure, good. you mm -hmm. know, 48 comes around and Ray McGovern talks about how in the Bronx, when Israel was first announced as a, as a country, people were marching up and down Grand Concourse right by Post Cottage. People were happy, like, yay, finally, you know, 
uh, Jewish people have a place where they can go and not feel persecuted and not have to, you know, be uh, be be ever subjected to what they just went through in World War II. So FDR, FDR <laughs> was pre pre presented multiple times with this idea of, hey, we should create an Israel. We should create an Israel. And every time FDR said, I mean, maybe, but if you put it where you want to put it now, you're just going to create a lot of conflict. And ultimately, had he lived, the speculation from the per his personal historian who was with him the entire time, he believes there would not have been an Israel. And frankly, I don't think it should have been created because, well, it's just the conflict you have now. And I mentioned right. the thing about people marching up and down Grand Concourse because people did not know and people to this day uh, you know, have a false history about that region. They thought it was just like some barren land or something. No, people didn't think there were already people living there. Um, okay, so then you've had the wars go on because people feel like, hey, wait, whoa, you can't just come onto my land and start, you know, so people were fighting and then the 67 war breaks out and then the resolution happens at the UN. Okay, so the resolution happens and like the border lines are drawn and I personally thought that they were completely unfair, right? Like, why is it that Israel gets way more land and the Gaza and West Bank are split and absolutely horrible also, right? Okay, more war, more conflict breaks out between this. And then you have Yitzhak Rabin and Arafat. Now, from what I can see, I, you know, because uh, Rabin was not a saint. Rabin was like the number one hunter of Palestinians, right? He was like the most rabid anti-Palestinian. And I think for him to have met with Arafat and agree to a peace deal with, you know, Clinton. And I've heard many criticisms of this deal. It, it, it wasn't perfect, I think. But Rab Rab Rabin would then be assassinated for the pursuit of peace, just like Arafat would too. And my view of that is, yeah, maybe these people weren't perfect and maybe the deal itself wasn't perfect and it was maybe always destined to go back the way it is. But both of these men were assassinated by Israelis, okay? Just on the very thought alone that you could cooperate and coexist with the other person. And I think it should be remembered that way that, hey, they died for this, for the idea that there could be some peace. Even if it wasn't perfect, they got shot because they thought we could try and actually have some peace. And I think in that spirit, I mean, I look at people like Margwan Bagudi today, who people say is the, you know, should be, because he's extremely popular on both fronts and he's somebody who could help bring peace to the region and to the conflict. And well, let me not get ahead of myself, but October 7th then happened, well, 2006 happens and Hamas comes into power um, and 50% of people who are living when, Hamas came into power were like under 12 or something, right? So first of all, they didn't vote. Half of the population didn't even vote for Hamas. But I've heard that Hamas would build universities. Um, there was a uh, an English teacher named Rafat uh, who was, um, I think people know this, he died back in, I think, January or something after he was targeted by Barry Weiss. And I was reading through Max Blumenthal's 51 Day War book and I found out that this English teacher was trying to teach his students to find the humanity within their oppressors. He had them reading The Merchant of Venice and everyone identified with Shylock. And there's this beautiful scene in The Merchant of Venice, you know, that monologue, Hath a Jew Not Eyes. And his students rewrote it as Hath a Palestinian Not Eyes. And one of his students also wrote this short story about um, an Israeli soldier killing a kindergartner and then having to go home and live with it and have nightmares about it every night. Like this was her trying to find the humanity within the oppressor. And I was just so deeply moved by that, that this teacher in Gaza set up in a university by Hamas is trying to find the humanity and teach his students to at least figure out the humanity in his oppressors because Rafat himself came to the United States and had a Malcolm X moment where he believed all Jews hated him because the only Jews he ever been surrounded by were people who were trying to put a boot on his neck and hold a rifle up to him. And he found that the Jews here in the United States treated him with kindness, empathy, and respect. And they were able to talk about things like Zionism without everyone trying to kill each other. And he understood them better. And that's what he was trying to bring back to the students of Gaza. So and then he was assassinated. And I, and like, I, I, 
when I put the two together that this was the same guy, I was like balling because I was like, oh my God, what a what an actual tragedy. So anyway, October 7th happens. And I don't think we still know exactly what happened on October 7th because why did it take seven hours for the IDF to respond at the concert? Why did they ignore Egyptian intelligence when they told them, hey, this is happening, right? Um, and, you know, now we're learning that a lot of the deaths that happened on October 7th were a result of indiscriminatory airstrikes by the Israelis uh, onto the concert. You know, they were just shooting people. So we don't really know what happened on October 7th, but it was definitely used as a pretext to try and wipe out all of Gaza uh, and the West and the West Bank. At some point, they're going to get to the West Bank next. But that's what that was. OK, I mean, I, what it was used for. So now you are where we are now. And. Um, Israel needs to be stripped of all of its aid and weapons that it's getting foreign right now. And I think there's a real legal basis and a foundation to honestly redefine what Israel is because of its actions that it's taken. Now, when I say Israel, I don't want people to think, because it's not true that everyone in Israel is behind the Netanyahu war policy. You know, that recently the families have been breaking into the Knesset, marching into the Knesset, demanding mm. that they reach a prisoner deal and a prisoner swap, right? There are people in Israel who want peace, okay? It's, so when I say Israel, I mean the, the Israeli government and the Netanyahu government, because it's also not everyone in the Knesset either that is on board with what's going on. There are people in the Knesset willing to broker a peace deal. So I think immediately there needs to be a ceasefire, of course. And is it my place as somebody who's running for the U.S. Congress to actually determine whether or not a country has a right to exist? I don't know. That's why I go by what the U.N. goes by. You know, I go by what the world has decided whether or not a country has a right to exist. I can say this. I support and I would do whatever I need for the United States to get behind right of return, enforce right of return and just get rid of all the, all the illegal settlements. But we don't have a government right now that we can actually trust, because if I were to propose right now, yeah, I think the U.S. military should go and clear out all the Israeli settlements and ensure that people can have a right to return. People will look at me like crazy. Like, what are you crazy? You can establish a military outpost in Palestine and Israel like that's what Israel is already. And I can't argue with them because I look at all the other 200 or 300 military bases we have around the world like it is just for control and colonization. So I don't think we can trust the United States to ever put that in. I think we can trust other countries like the Russians and Chinese and the BRICS countries who have been saying, well, we want to figure out a way we can bring peace. I think if it's an international collaboration to actually secure the right of return for the people of Palestine and have security guarantees, well, then now you're talking. And then you have to immediately rebuild Gaza because it's just rubble right now. I mean, it should look like Shanghai. I, I said this on another program where I said it should look like New York City. And they're like, what are you, crazy? New York City looks like shit right now. <laughs> it's like, okay, Shanghai then. It should look like Shanghai in five years. I think that can happen. It's just a, It just has to be an international collaborative effort. So that's how let I see ask, it. Let yeah. me ask you this. One of the things that has been used by the Zionists, by the government, is to call people, you know, anti-Semitic. You remember when um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was running in England and they this big thing, he's anti-Semitic. Well, they called him anti-Semitic. They also called him a Russian spy or something like that, but they used this stuff. Let me show you something. I want you to look at something. And sure. I want you to tell me if you're a member of Congress, if this is something that would you would find concerning. This is a naval building. It is in California, in San Diego. Here's an article, the Norris, notorious history of California still standing. Look at this, a swastika shaped oh naval God. building, the United States Navy. Right now, this is not way back when or anything. You Now, there's no way that anybody can look at this and say, well, perhaps it was an error. I think they were trying to make the letter Z or something like that. Perhaps they were. No, clearly the United States Navy. This is at the uh, naval base Coronado, San Diego. Uh, um, you know, but meanwhile, 
right now, people will look at you and listen to what yeah. you have to say when you say you're evaluating um, Israel as a nation. You're evaluating Israel from an international policy perspective, from a moral perspective, which is what it should be expected. That's how we should evaluate them. When you do that, those who disagree with you will say he's an anti-Semitic. He's anti-Semitic. You know the game. Meanwhile, yeah. the U.S. government is calling everybody anti-Semitic. Literally has a friggin' Nazi sign in at the at the uh, San Diego Naval Base, a military base. Your thoughts on that? Jose. Well, no, I mean, I already get called anti-Semitic. I already get called. I was always being called a Putin agent when I was doing the interventions two years ago and a year ago. And now I'm being called anti-Semitic. I mean, and I associate with people who are being called anti-Semitic because of their uh, stance on where they say, see the Israel-Gaza war. I don't even think I'm as extreme as, as other people. But in terms of like what I think should happen in Israel and Gaza, the anti-Semitic thing has always been used as a way to uh, label, uh, libel people, as a way to discredit people, as a way to say, well, you know, um, uh, well, you're just an anti-Semite. That's why you see things that way. I mean, that's why I associate with, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, like, uh, one of my associations with the LaRouche organization, because Diane Sayre has been labeled an anti-Semite, Lyndon LaRouche has been labeled an anti-Semite because we went after the ADL. We went after the Anti-Defamation League over and over again, and we stomped on it, and we made documents on it as to, like, why the ADL has always been set up to discredit anybody it deems a threat, not just to the state of Israel, but to anybody who starts speaking any kind of common sense. Okay, then... It's like, I'm the anti-Semite, but Jon Stewart is out here giving Nazis awards, or Joe Biden is shaking hands with literal neo-Nazis, with Oleg Tianabak, people who have openly saluted, right? So, you know, I'm the anti-Semite because I think people shouldn't be dead in Gaza. I'm an anti-Semite because I think we should be bringing clean water to Gaza and the West Bank and Palestine. but you can openly work with neo-Nazis and fund them and even say they should be in power, as was the case with Victoria Nuland when they were talking about, well, who should be in power after Yanukovych is gone? You know, it's an absurdity, one, that if you just highlight, it already, like, takes away what people are are are, are thinking and are... Uh, uh, you can kind of, like, judo people into this state of reality again of, like... If somebody's calling you an anti-Semite, all you have to say is, we gave $50 billion to neo-Nazis in Ukraine, okay? Who's the real anti-Semite here, all right? You know, I think, uh, yeah, I think I think I don't, I don't need to say more than that other than, you know, if, if I'm going to be called an anti-Semite for wanting peace, I mean, what more can I do, you know? I mean, I guess it's, I guess the, the pro- the not anti-Semite point is to say, yeah, Palestine should be wiped out. And if you disagree with that, then you're an anti-Semite. Well, you know what's interesting? And there are people in the chat saying, oh, it's an ancient Hindu signal. Uh, uh, that swastika is ancient Hin Hindu insignia and icon, blah, blah, blah. Here's the bottom line. That um, uh, those buildings were designed in 1968, right? 23 mm -hmm. years after World War II, they still had TV shows on like Hogan's Heroes and McHale's Navy. People were acutely aware. They were still, think about it. You had people who had served in 1945 at like 18 years old, right? Uh, yeah. They were only like 41. People who had served in World War II were 41. Most of the people who had served, you know, if you served, if you were 20, if you served, if you were 40, you were only 63. You know what I mean? So that whole generation was still alive. They knew good and damn well what a swastika was. That was not a Hindu anything in 1968. You know what I mean? They 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 knew what it was. I mean, you could go back a thousand years and say, oh, we found it in an ancient pyramid 2,500 years ago. In 1968, they knew what that was, and they did it for them. Oh, might I add, in 1968, NASA and the U.S. military industrial complex was loaded with Nazi scientists that were still there designing the NASA stuff. Design, you know what I mean? So the not only, I, I will guarantee you this, that Navy base right there, 
head Nazis, head former Nazis were working there from the Nazi regime in World War II. So, but at any rate, okay. China. Well, I the just, next thing, you know, to, to, to bounce on that. I mean, the United, you know, after the Civil War, after the Confederates lost, you know, a lot of the Confederate statues that are up today were put up after the Civil War. As oh yeah. A way, you know, right? Like as a way. A to, lot of them put up in like the 1950s and 60s. So yeah, a lot of right. uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of them. Like when Martin Luther King started marching and all that stuff, a lot of Southern states were like, "Oh man, what are we going to do?" I know. Let's put up a bunch of Civil War statues and stuff like that. Yeah. So you know, no, it's obvious that, that, what they were for. Um, right, let's go exactly. to China. Let's yeah. go to China now. I'd love to go to China. That's a place I'd really love to go. I hear it's beautiful. But at any rate, so here's what we got. For the Democrats, they got Russia. Hey, Russia is evil. Russia, 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 right? And a lot of conservatives were like, oh, how stupid are they? My God, the neocons are dragging Joe Biden and the neocons are dragging them in to think Russia's evil, right? So Joe Biden and the neocons go, hey, now China's evil. And all these conservatives go, well, I mean, you know, I think Joe Biden's got a point here. And I'm like, I cannot believe how naive and gullible Americans are. It's Russia. It's China. I guess next it'll be India, whoever the hell. It has to be India. If you think about it, India is a large country that's growing. So it's Russia. It's China. Next comes India. Your thoughts on this? Number one, the concept that there are three world powers and one of them has come to the border of the other two, building military bases surrounding the other two, yet the other two are the yeah. bad guys. Our relationship with China has always been kind of strained because when Kissinger went to China and opened up talks and spoke with Mao, and uh, uh, the intention was not to try and actually build world relations. That was actually an incidental thing. Kissinger at the time was trying to destabilize uh, uh, countries and their relationships with each other. Nonetheless, though, being in China, uh, I, I was there uh, last uh, last summer, becoming fall. It was it was beautiful. I mean, I was in uh, Beijing, and then I went to Chengdu in the Sichuan province. Uh, I got to visit some of the top universities. I got to give presentations to like the president of Chengdu University, um, and uh, it was it was absolutely a wild ten days, and one I wish I could go back to because man, China, you go there. When I mean, I'll tell you this, like. When we were there, because we were part of the Schiller Institute delegation trip, what hit us first was almost shame because we're there supposed to represent the best of the United States. And when we were there, we're like, wait, this place is like, like just looking at it, you look at it and you're like, it's way better than the streets of New York City. It's way <laughs> yeah. better than like what the United States looks like right now. Like that's just the truth. And you like talk to people over there and they're like happy and they're optimistic. And if you ask the Chinese what they think about the US, they say, yeah, I think we need to work together. I think I think peace is possible. Like you say that, like they, that's what they think. They think that peace is possible. And this, these were like, I was talking about like store clerks, customers, uh, people at bars and stuff. Cause a lot of people that just speak English, not perfect, but they speak English. And they all say like, yeah, no, man, Americans are great, I think. And they say, like, more Americans should just come to China and see the truth and see what China is actually like. And I agree. I think more people should go there. So in terms of, like, the grand geopolitical scale, our relationship with China has at least official policy ever since Carter was the one who established, okay, well, we recognize one China, and that's the mainland China. We don't see Taiwan. We don't follow that anymore because we've been intentionally trying to provoke a war to break out between Taiwan and the mainland China. That's just always been the case. That's why when Nancy Pelosi flies over to Taiwan, she's completely insane because she could have provoked another war going on there. And then we have this, what do you call, strategic ambiguity, right, uh, surrounding the, the Taiwan issue. It's like, well, if China invades, we might go in, we might not. I can tell you this, the Chinese are a whole hell of a lot more patient than the Russians are, okay? They they like they just say this openly, right? You know, they're not as hot-headed as the Russians, okay? You can try and provoke the Chinese, they'll be patient because they well, understand. Well, I will say this though. I will say this. I, I would in in a way I would push back, I disagree a little bit with for this reason. The US hasn't gotten to the level 
that they have with Ukraine. For instance, if the, the U.S. didn't like formally overthrow the government of Taiwan, they kind of, you know, they're influencing it all, but they didn't formally like just overthrow the government and put people in and start building military bases and putting in missiles and crazy stuff like that. And, 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 and literally saying uh, the British literally said, we're going to build a base on the Black Sea in Odessa, you know, and then when the Russians finally attacked um, was the uh, what if you remember this, Zelensky went to like one of these NATO meetings and said, yeah, we want nuclear weapons. And at that point, the Russians are like, OK, you got taking us a little too far. This is going bad. So I think the difference is the U.S. has been more overt on Ukraine than they were because that was their move first. You know what I mean? We got to get that first. And I think let me let me say this. I gotta add this. I think part of the hidden secret here is that the Russians, I mean, excuse me, the, the neocons here in the US have three economic blocks that they really wanna destroy. One's Russia, one's China, and one's the EU. Because um, uh, um, Henry Kissinger said, I mean, not Henry Kissinger, John Bolton said that basically the in his book, the neocons view um, behind China, the neocons view the Europe, European bloc as their second biggest economic uh, competitor, right? So I really think as quiet as it's kept, they intended to destroy the European um, continent's economy. And I think they saw it as we can destroy Russia's economy, which of course didn't work, but and we can destroy Europe's economy and sub completely subjugate Europe. And that way we can knock out two of the three powerful economies that we're concerned with. What do you think about that? Well, I think, um, well, first of all, on your point that like, well, we aren't as overt in Taiwan as we are in Ukraine. Now that's true, but I think you're I think what's being missed is the way in which China responds to provocations versus the Russians respond to provocations. Because Xi Jinping was here in San Francisco uh, last year. I think he met with Biden in, yeah, in San Francisco. And it's like every time the U.S. tries to provoke China, like Janet Yellen recently said, like, yeah, the Chinese produce way too much commercial crap. And that's why the economy is bad, because the Chinese are the problem. Uh, <laughs> Xi Jinping's response was, in San Francisco to just being in San Francisco was, I think 50,000 American students should come to China every year and just see it. It's like the way he responds to like the aggression and the uh, provocations. Now it is not at the level at that they do with Russia. That's very true. I'm not disagreeing with you there, but anytime they try to do something with Xi Jinping, it's always like, how about you guys come over here? How about they still keep it open? It's like a it's like a lover who's trying to look beyond their abusive boyfriend and love them anyway. You know, I don't know how the Chinese do it, but they keep inviting the United States every year to join the BRICS initiative. They keep inviting the United States to join the Belt and Road Initiative. They don't come off as adversarial. It's the United States that tries to turn their relationship into an adversarial one. Um, on the thing with... Um, uh, can you tell me again about the Bolton point? Oh, my other point was that the um, the the U.S. If you really look at it, they didn't just want to destroy China and Russia. They also view um, the Europeans as a competitor, an economic competitor, and they wanted to yeah. both destroy the European economy and subjugate them so that they have that you know they they answer to us and they have no uh independence and sovereignty whatsoever what little they have which ain't much so that was part of it they wanted to take out Europe along with Russia at the same time yeah that's just not I mean that's just not true because the Chinese have developed their own economy rapidly right? ever since and, and, and i mean remember keep in mind keep in mind i'm saying the u.s wanted to take out russia and china at the same time but yeah go ahead no yeah i yeah, mean yeah, russia no, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry i'm confusing everything here let me be clear my point was when the u.s started this thing in ukraine it was we're going to put all of these sanctions on russia and destroy russia's economy but we're going to cut the EU off from cheap Russian energy, which will also destroy the European economy. And then we'll yeah. be in full control of both the EU and Russia. I'm sorry. I, I didn't make it as clear as I should have. No, 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 sure. I mean, 
for one, when the sanctions happened, it only strengthened Russia's economy because the idea of what people an economy is and our own government is so inane and stupid. They think that an economy is just trade. Uh, yes, it is for Europe, which was dependent upon a lot of Russian oil and gas. And now you just let the Russians keep it all, basically. And the Russians are like, no problem. Like, you understand, this is a country that has a history of communism, where they like working in factories and industry, like that's just embedded in their blood. OK, they're going to get their shit together and they're going to figure it out. OK, and that's what they did. So the Russian sanctions only strengthen the Russian economy. And the only people suffering right now are the European countries whose economic outlook is not on, hey, how do we make sure our country can be self-sufficient and sovereign? Why don't we advance, you know, take on more advanced forms of energy? Because if Germany right now had actually kept its nuclear programs, they would not be in the state they're in right now with their energy where they're like, well, we just lost Nord Stream and now we don't get 40 percent of our energy anymore. And now they have to pay three times more to get liquefied natural gas shipped from the United States all the way to Germany. It's insanely expensive. Right. So the reason why these economies are failing is is not even because the, the, the they cut off the trade with Russia is because their economic outlook was, well, war is our main driving productive factor. And that doesn't reflect reality because war does not feed people, okay? War does not put food on the table. It doesn't put houses or roofs over people's heads or builds beds for people, maybe military bases, but that's about mm -hmm. it, you know? And, like, that's what people are suffering right now. And the Russians are like, no problem. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. So, yeah. You know, what's interesting, I think we've learned also something. You know, the Russians had from when the Soviet Union, right? They had these big factories that they kept. They didn't let them go bad, right? If you look at what happened, the US sent everything over and just tore the factories down. They're just rotten out, falling apart in Ohio and Michigan, et cetera, right? The Russians kept all of that stuff and they've got the people. So when they needed to crank these factories up and crank up their industrial capacity again, all they had to do was flip the switch, turn the light switch on and go back in there. Your thoughts on U.S. industry, U.S. industrialization, deindustrialization, et cetera, and maybe your thoughts on what could be done. Sure. And this will let me talk a little bit about my domestic policy, too, as to what I would want. So 1971 comes around and Nixon takes us off the gold standard and completely dismantles what at the time was called the Bretton Woods Economic Initiative. And the idea was that ever since FDR, we had this economy built on the idea of like, hey, what if instead of judging our economy based on how much money people are spending, which is the Keynesian policy, why don't we just do things that improve people's lives, like building bridges, building rail, building housing, building basic infrastructure, sewage plants? You know, when FDR was governor of New York before he was president, he brought electricity to like the most rural farm fields out in upstate New York. And everyone said, what are you, crazy? Why would we bring, why would we waste so much money bringing power to like these few farms that are up in upstate New York? People didn't realize this allowed them to have refrigeration. This allowed them to invent new techniques and have new techniques that could actually allow them to produce way more food. You take that and you upscale it to the entire nation. It's like, of course you want to develop undeveloped regions because it allows you to create more bountiful things and plentiful resources for yourself. So that was the policy from the 19, and it was also what built the country, because this is actually all Hamiltonian, too. I mean, this is what Alexander Hamilton built his whole idea on credit. It's like, okay, well, if you want to build massive projects, you need a way to actually fund them. So you take out, you have a national bank that funds these projects, and its only job with the bank is to actually take the money out to fund these projects, and it gets paid back over the course of decades because these things aren't immediately profitable. Building a bridge is not immediately profitable. In fact, I believe if you build a bridge, you should only have a toll. And then once it's fully paid off, then you stop the toll because it's been fully paid off. George Washington Bridge here in New York, for one. But um, now, so Nixon took us off the gold standard and we became a floating exchange as a result of that. And so basically the dollar's value was not tied to anything physical, just speculation. It's like, well, it's, it's imaginary. It's imaginary. It's like, well, what are other people willing to pay for our currency? That's what... That's what inevitably happened. And as a result, it shifted our focus away from, well, um, 
why do we need all these factories and industry if we're not actually going to build anything because our economy is not based on anything physical anymore? We could save a whole lot more money if we just shut them down. So here in the Bronx, for example, there are tons of abandoned factories that are now being repurposed for dumb things. Uh, just like down in Manhattan and Brooklyn, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of factories and industry that have been shut down and are being repurposed for like restaurants or something. We don't have a productive economy anymore. We have had now we have had not had any real industrialization. There is still some industry here, of course, but it's not at the level at which it once was, and that's why you have such a destruction and collapse in the country because people aren't producing the materials needed to actually keep our economy afloat and building. Right, like China is beating us in steel. Uh, but also, why aren't we exporting maglev trains? Why aren't we exporting maglev rail? Why aren't we building <laughs> nuclear power plants around the country? So my solution to this as, a, as somebody who's coming in, deciding to make policy is I have this idea of reviving FDR's program called the CCC in the 30s, which stands for Civilian Conservation Corps. Anyone between the ages of 18 to 26 was allowed in this program. And the thing was, at the time, they were just coming out of the Great Depression. So all of the young people had no education, they had no jobs, they had no marketable skills, they were all unemployed, um, and they were illiterate. And FDR said, well, I gotta do something about this. So he put them all into these work camps where they actually got training and an education, and they built a lot of our national parks, they built some infrastructure, and then they would go on to work on some of the national infrastructure programs, like building the highways or building rail. Or um, uh, then they would then go on to fight in World War II, or they became part of the arsenal of democracy and working in these factories. So today, for the Bronx, you have an even worse problem with our youth, where people are severely uneducated, severely unskilled, to the point where they're killing themselves by using drugs all day or something, or resorting to some kind of inane thing like starting an OnlyFans to make a living because they have to sell their body and prostitute their body as a way to make a, a living. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. So you say, okay, well, we're going to reinstitute these work camps. And by the time you graduate in two years, you're going to treat it like boarding school because you have to take people out of their neighborhood, which is what's killing them. Uh, you take people out of their neighborhood and you treat it like a boarding school where people can go back home for holidays and stuff. And you give them on the job site training. You give them an education so they can be literate. And you say, by the time you graduate, you'll be at the level of a NASA engineer. That's at the level at which you will be by the time you graduate. And for the two years that we paid you and trained you, you're going to work for us for two years. You're going to go back to your neighborhood. You're going to build a hospital that was shut down. You're going to build a school that was shut down. You're going to fix the subway system. You're going to build a new subway line, okay, that's desperately needed in New York City right now. A cross Bronx train would be amazing. Uh, you're actually going to build the foundations for there to be a maglev train that goes from Boston to New York. So you can get to Boston in an hour or Washington, D.C. to New York in an hour rather than than the three hour drive it takes right now. And that is your life. Your life will be making life better for others because we trained you how to do it. And then after those two years are up, it's like, OK, well, you can either keep working for us or now you're marketable. Now you have skills. Start your own engineering company. Start your own, you know, carpentry company. You start your own construction company. Build stuff because by the time we map out the United States and we see all the projects that are needed just to bring us to modern day standards, there's going to be so many contracting bids. We don't have enough construction companies right now to take them all up. And that's exciting because that means we need more people. And that means you can actually use some of the migrants that are coming in and saying, like, look, if you want to stay in the country and you want citizenship, are you willing to build a new city? Are you willing to build a new town? Are you willing to build 10,000 houses so that people can live in so that you can live in? And in exchange, we'll give you citizenship. And it's like, well, wait, what is that person's identity? Are they still an illegal immigrant if they were responsible for building a new town and a new city in the United States? Because the last time we built a new city was like, I think, Las Vegas or something in the 60s. So that's my domestic policy. And that's my response to the whole industrial. Yeah. Here's one. And I, I'm just going to put this up and get your get your uh, get your thoughts on it. There we go. <clears throat> Yeah. There we Northrop go. Grumman to develop concept for lunar railroad railroad. Northrop Grumman uh, has been selected by DARPA to develop further develop the concept of building a moon based railroad network as part of the broad, broader 10 year lunar architecture capability study. So we can't get railroads built here on friggin <laughs> Earth. 
right? Yes, we got a bridge uh, 12 minutes from my house is the key bridge that has collapsed, right? And as I've said before, if I get on a boat, I can get there even quicker. It's right around, the creek is right, come the creek where I live is right around the corner. It empties right out at the, at, at the bridge, right? So we can't, it's going to take us a decade to rebuild the bridge. Are they like, hey, Northrop Grumman, can you build the bridge faster? Can you fix our tunnels? Nope, nope. On the friggin' moon. And you know what that's about? China and Russia have talked about building a moon base, right? And I don't know if you, if you look into it, there is a called helium three, I believe it is. Are you familiar with yeah. that? The whole thing. I've written papers on it. I've studied it. Right. I, You're, but I, just to fill people in very lightly, there is a uh, something on the, it is helium three, right? I believe. Yes, it is helium three on the moon. Helium where... three. It's mostly found on the dark side of the moon. But the bottom line is, it's something that can be used to have a nuclear style power plant that doesn't have all of this crap left over afterwards, right? That makes it a lot easier. The bottom line is this. Russia and China, they're like looking at building a base. And it's obvious because they want to get there, get the helium three. And guess what? We got new energy. We got long energy. You know what I mean? It's taking advantage of a way to move forward with new options for energy. Right. So the U.S. says, oh, Russia and China is going to build something. Hey, we're going to build something, too. Well, bottom line is we're thirty four trillion dollars in debt. We can't build a railroad here in the United States. We can't get a bridge up for freaking 10 years. But no, uh, Northrop Grumman. And as you know, if Northrop Grumman gets those contracts, ain't no bridge. They're going to just get money for the next 25 years. Nothing's going to be gotten to them. Nothing's going to be laid on the moon. They don't even intend to do anything on the moon. Just another money laundering operation. How absurd is that? Your thoughts on that, um, uh, 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 Jose? Well, I'm a proponent of space travel. I love the idea that people will be on the moon someday. So I'll, I'll just say that, and maybe this will be a point of contention. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm not against space travel. I'm just saying we got hungry people and our crap's falling. Right. You know what I mean? Like China, sure, if, if they got 220,000 miles of high-speed rail, right? And all this yeah. stuff, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got bridges and railroads. Perhaps I can consider a bridge on a, a, a railroad on the moon. Here, the place is yeah. a friggin' disaster, and people are wandering around homeless, sleeping in tents, pooping on the streets. Perhaps we got bigger fish to fry before we move forward. That's what I, that's my position. So, you know, I think this question on the Kim Iverson show, Helga Zeplarouche was on there. She was interviewed by Kim Iverson, and this question came up. So there's many ways I could tackle this. First on helium-3. Helium-3, the great thing about helium-3 is that instead of helium, which helium-4 has two protons and two neutrons, so when the fusion process happens, the extra neutron is thrown away, and thus you get nuclear waste. With right. helium-3, because it's only two protons and one neutron, and the fusion process happens, you don't get the waste. That's the theory. Exactly. Of so it's, it's actually a good resource to have because with only like yay much of this helium three, you could power all of China for like a week or so. So if you have this much, if you have, I guess, a lot of helium three, you can power the world for decades and if not, you know, centuries, right? So nuclear fusion and helium three is a good thing, I think, to have. Now, the idea that Northrop Gummit should have this uh, this contract is a little insane to me, but. Helga Zeplarouche made this point. She has this thing called the Swords into Plowshares Act, that we need to repurpose our tools our, of war into things like plowshares, things that can benefit people. What if Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and their engineers, instead of using the trillion dollar defense budget, were actually set to and figure out, well, what's the most efficient way we can build high-speed rail around the country? What if we can retool our military industrial complex and these companies and these people who are talented in engineering and say, hey, how about instead of trying to figure out how to kill people, you figure out how to foster conditions of life so that people can flourish? This is her idea. She calls this the Swords into Plowshare Act. And I thought it was very interesting because it's like the people who work at these companies, like the, the actual minds who make this stuff, are actually really smart. You know, you have to be in order to actually figure out what's the best way you can kill people in the least amount of resources. 
they also might be completely fucked up and insane to, to, to be thinking this as well. But if you then give them a contract and say, hey, actually, we have about 10,000 hungry people around the country and we need more farms and we need to figure out how to make our farming more fruitful and more uh, uh, bountiful so that we can have even less farms that produce more food, would they actually do it? I think you could actually get those people to say, well, with enough money, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll figure it out. and. They'll do it. And it actually makes sense. I mean, Jimmy Dore has a great segment on this because and I was at one of his live shows and he was doing crowd work. And one guy's like, oh, I work for Lockheed Martin. And and Jimmy Dore says, and you're here at my show? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's like, yeah, like it sucks. Like I build missile systems that are used in Gaza and I, I have to live with that every day. And I just wish I could use my talents for something better. Like, yeah, but see, that's the thing. Our Our country's orientation is not on that. It's how do we kill people and how do we implement war better? That's that's our country's orientation. Whereas what if our country's orientation was how do we actually rebuild our neighborhoods? How do we actually make sure that people can actually live and eat better uh, and 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 not have to, you know, figure out how to like if you took our brilliant minds and put them to fix our problems rather than trying to kill people, you would have a completely different country. And I think that that's kind of like the solution there. I, I think I would agree with Helga that we should be retooling our industries so that they're not producing missiles and drones and things of war, but they're producing things like maglev trains, nuclear power plants, new advanced machine tools, you know, that can build cars quicker than an assembly line can at Ford, you know, be building and creating new technological advances that can be used in the rebuilding of Palestine. You know, now maybe that's a radical idea to think we can retool our military industrial complex to actually help people. But I think why waste the potential and talent that people have in building things and coming up with solutions and putting it towards something good? So the Lunar Railroad idea is a good idea in theory, in principle, excuse me, not in theory, in principle. And Russia and China definitely should go and follow that. The United States, I think, should readopt its space program because, like, that's that's that goes to the whole national orientation. If your orientation is how can we make sure people can live on the moon for decades at a time, what kind of technologies do we need? Those technologies transfer here on Earth. You know, there's this thing that for every, people keep citing this: for every dollar we spent on the Apollo space program, we got ten dollars back. But it wasn't because we put advertisements on the moon or something. It was because the technological advancements that came from it allowed us to have stuff like the phone. You know, it allowed us to have, you know, like the pacemaker was one invention directly straight from the uh, 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 Apollo program. Because it's like, well, what if one of our guys has a heart attack uh, while they're going up to, to space? Like, what can we do to make sure that, you know, that they can restart their heart? Oh, what if there was something implanted in there? pacemaker and the pacemaker as a result was a technological advancement insulation from the shuttles like how do we make sure that if a fire breaks out on the outside or inside that our guys don't get burnt up thus new technologies were invented in insulation firefighters then adopted some of these technologies in their uniforms as well everything evolves and adapts when you have a national orientation towards a future and that technology has always been used as a way for the for the for the general good and the general market you know that was the benefit of the apollo program is that it did help people here you know, it did eventually come down and allowed us to live in a much more advanced and technological uh, a way than we ever have before. Yeah. The key being, as you're saying to that is <clears throat> retooling, the, you know, like you can't have military. That, that, and I think this is what you got to realize. Our military is to the point where you can't have, you know, people say, well, you can't have military and this or military and that. Our military is so huge that you can't have military and anything. You can't have military in the United States and infrastructure and bridges and health care yeah. and colleges and anything because now our military budget just sucks the country dry. Yeah, exactly. And I think when the when when we first founded like the, the original Navy and the original conception of there to be a U.S. military was one that was actually disciplined and built and build it to build things. You know, um, a lot of the guys who were in our early army, like in like the early 1800s, 
these guys were builders. They were they were they were working in ironworks and things like this, and then they would go out and develop and be a part of the building process of the United States. That was our original conception of our military. It was we go out and we build things and we defend our country if we need to at the time. Like it wasn't this like we have to go be imperialist, colonialist. It was no, let's go build things. Like that's always what the original conception of West Point was. It's like if you're actually going to seriously contribute and give your life to your country, what is it then that your responsibility is? That was always the conception of West Point. Yes, you learned military tactics. Yes, you learned how to fight. And you also understood what it meant to be uh, a citizen and what it meant to be a soldier to give your life to your country. And if that meant you had to go and build some engineering or infrastructure projects, then yeah, you did it. That's what the Army Corps of Engineers does today. I mean, I think the Army Corps of Engineers is the only redeeming thing about our military right this second, because it's the only branch of our government that actually still builds things, you know, not just here, but around the world, emergency camps. Like, and I'm saying we need to have that be the focus of our nation, setting up these work camps that are kind of held up and, and trained by people who are in the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, give people that kind of discipline, because this allows you to also get nonviolent offenders a second chance at life. You know, you have this kind of like discipline, maybe not everyone needs it at the extent of like, you know, you're going to get up and do 50 push ups in the morning, and you're going to run around some miles, but some form of discipline that will allow you to break the habits and things that are preventing you from developing your mind, and then replacing it with things that are good for you and good for your country. That should be our orientation. Right now, our country is so depraved, and it is so in the deep depths of hell that our, our discussion should be, how are we going to make sure we still even exist in the next five to 10 years? Are we even going to make it to the 250th anniversary okay, of, of the founding of this country, You know, the ratification of the Constitution? I don't think so, unless we actually do some desperate action right now to save our generation. Thanks very much. Where can people go to find all of your stuff, Jose? People should can go to votevega.nyc. It's been a couple months since I was on here, and I just want to say, you know, I've I quit my job. I was working part time at a, as a barista, and now I'm 100% in on this campaign. Every inch of my being, every minute of my time will be spent on this campaign. That's the promise I'm making to you and to everyone who wants to support me. And um, I just think everything's just so depraved. People should help me petition. I will be petitioning in eight days. If you hit that volunteer button, you can come and petition with me in the Bronx, get me on the ballot. And you get to meet me personally. And uh, how about the yeah. cat? Do they get to meet the cat? <laughs> Ozzy Mandius? Only if they get 500 <laughs> signatures. If they get 500 signatures, I will bring you into my home and you can <laughs> pet my cat. <laughs> so, All right. That looks like a good cat there, man. It looks like he's got the situation in control. He's our chief. Uh, he's our mascot. He's my uh, chief of staff. So, yeah, he's got it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, dude. Well, thank you very much, everybody. That's Jose Vega. Uh, make sure you share this on all your social media platforms. As you know, I'm not on Twitter. Maybe when Jose gets to Congress, he can call Elon Musk or something. But at any rate, and, and maybe they can figure out who I am because they don't know who owns my account. On, they don't. They have no clue who owns at Garland Nixon on Twitter, apparently. They're having trouble figuring yes. that one out. All right. Thanks a lot. Everybody, share this on all your social media platforms. Peace. We're out.